God, Abba, Father. How great is the matter of love that you have for us that we should call your children. How great is your mercy and grace that you might use even a broken vessel to pour forth your water of eternal life. So, Father, I ask that you might now use this broken vessel to be an instrument of your righteousness, to be an instrument of your good news. Father, I ask in these ensuing moments that I might decrease and that he might increase, that these words of my mouth and these meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. So, most of you, uh, most of you I think I've, I've known for, at this point for, for um, a whole bunch of years. You know, even, even, even Sister Rosalind. I think the first time Sister Rosalind saw me wearing a collar, she nearly fell out of her seat there. It's like, you? You? You're a, you're a preacher? And, um, um, I, um, I, I didn't necessarily start out, uh, I didn't necessarily start out looking to preach the good news. I, I wasn't exactly avoiding it. It wasn't as if I were running away from it. It's just that I was thinking maybe someone else needed to do that. You, you know, maybe someone else needs to be preaching the good news. And uh, the Holy Spirit caught up with me. The Holy Spirit caught up with me, I guess in a, in a pretty big way. And, and uh, interestingly enough, that didn't take all that long, really. The Holy Spirit was moving on pretty fast wings. It didn't take all that long. And pretty soon I started preaching the good news. But um, as I started to preach the good news, something else, uh, something else happened. You see, what took a little bit longer was a little more complex. What, what took a whole lot of Holy Spirit kicks in the butt. Yeah, yeah. You see, in this church, you can say kicks in the butt, okay? It just can. It, it took a whole lot of Holy Spirit kicks in the butt and a whole lot of Holy Spirit dummy slaps upside the head to get me to not preach the bad news along with the good news. To not preach the so-so news. Good news in Koine Greek is evangelion. Evangelion is good news. And bad news is disevangelion. And uh, what I discovered is there was just so much of a tendency uh, in myself and in so many other preachers to want to preach the good news, but to also pepper, if you would, with the bad news. To say things like, God saves you, but God loves you, but. And, and you know, where every phrase sort of began with God, and it, somewhere in the middle of it was a, was a, well, how do I put this? It was a great big but. And, uh, I, I developed a word for that kind of thinking, and I developed a word for that kind of preaching, whether I was doing it or somebody else, and I developed a word for the kind of people who do that kind of preaching. I call them God butts. They're God butts, and that's right. And, and you don't want to be a God butt. I know I don't want to be a God butt, I know I've been a God butt a lot. And I'm really trying to repent of it. You, you see, I believe that the Lord is calling me and you and all of us who bear his name, to preach the good news, to proclaim peace, not to proclaim the bad news, not to proclaim the semi-okay news, not to proclaim the all right sort of news, but the good news. And if you're wondering where I get this, these, these thoughts from, the core of my belief on this, uh, I just want to Go ahead, and part of this, you know, some of you may already be aware of this, and part of this is because this is, right now this is going out to uh, our, our colleagues uh, in uh, Uganda, so this is partly, uh, so they can understand where I'm coming from, because boy, they really need to understand where I'm coming from before I set foot on their shorts. They need to be very, very aware of where I'm coming from. So, if you get nothing else out of the rest of this, there's two points I want you to know, before we even get into the text, my core beliefs. And I'm not going to try to force them on you. I'm not going to try to make you believe this. But I'm going to put it out there. And oh Lord, I'm going to try to convince you this is the way. Yeah. So, um, the, the first one, it comes from 1 John. 1 John 1, 5. 1 
John 1 and 5. God is light. It starts right in the letters. God is light. And it's followed up by, in him, there is no darkness. God is about light. You see, God, unlike your pastor, is always filled with light. The second part, the second part that I want to get to is, in God, there is no shadow of turning. That's a kind of old-fashioned turn of phrase. In God, there is no shadow of turning. That's, that's from the book of James, James 1.17. No shadow of turning. Well, what does that mean? It sounds so churchy. It sounds so elegant. It sounds, it sounds like something out of a musty old hymn or something. But there it is, James 1.17. No shadow of turning. And it works kind of like this. You see, we human beings are changeable. We're minimal. We're mercurial. We're just plain wishy-washy. <laughs> well, we are. For example, I might get up one morning and, and I might be feeling great. I'm just feeling great and I smile at everybody. I don't want to look at that smile, I guess. I smile at everybody. You're also looking like this. I, I'm just happy with everybody. I got a fine, good word for everybody and everything is just going along great. And the next day, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm not feeling so good. And all of a sudden, I'm grouchy. And all of a sudden, it's almost like I, I, I've got an evil twin or something. Now, maybe you don't have this problem. Maybe you never have this problem. But if you are, I want to know where the real people are. <laughs> and who brought you back to here? <laughs> you see, we as human beings, we are very, very changeable. And some of us, hide that better than others, some of us bring that in better than others, and we're pretty changeable. Yeah. But God is solid. God is consistent. Mm -hmm. Or at least this is what I believe. Which brings me to the next point. The next point is that if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what God is like, you need to look at Jesus. Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. What does God think? He thinks like Jesus. How does God act? He acts like Jesus. So if we say to ourselves, there is no darkness, in Jesus, there's no darkness in the Father. If we say to ourselves, there's no shadow of turning in the Father, there is no shadow of turning in Jesus. If we say to ourselves, there is no violence in Jesus, we must say to ourselves, there is no violence in the Father. And that is why, that is why the only thing I can possibly preach to you is good news. Now, by now you might be thinking, well, you know, the Bible is full of texts. Don't exactly seem like they're good news. And religious people are forever. Yeah, God, but, God, but. If you go to a church and a preacher doesn't eventually get to the good news. If you go to a Bible study, and the Bible study leader doesn't eventually get to the good news. If you have a conversation with somebody about God or about religion, and it doesn't come around to the good news, then it ain't my kind of Jesus. Amen. It ain't my kind of God. Because God is light. No darkness, no shadow of turning, no violence. So that brings us to our text. And here's the gospel text for today. It's from the gospel according to Luke. It's at the 21st chapter, and I would ask you to read along with this and uh, keep your thumb or finger or some convenient piece of paper here because we're going to refer back to it just a little bit in a little while. Luke 21. And I'm going to start reading.
writing in the 25th verse. The 25th verse. And listen to this. There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity and the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. He told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful. Or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that they will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Let me just teach you something that you might want to use in this church, you might want to use in some other church. It's kind of a commercial of sorts, it's a, it's a commercial, but we're not gonna we're not gonna break any copyrights, I don't think, because I know we have a patent attorney here among us and he's watching. Um, did I say this? Oh, I've said the worst things than that. Um, some of you might be old enough to remember a commercial. The commercial with the tagline was, where's the Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I almost didn't want to say that to church, right? Where's the beef? You know, what was that, what was that commercial for? One of the fast food restaurants, right? Okay. Okay, there you go. Well, I want to teach you a variation on that. Where's the good news? Where's the good news? I think it's a worthy question. When you're reading a Bible passage, when you're listening to a sermon, anywhere, where's the good news? Because I believe that's what we're about. I believe we are people, Christians, little Christ, Christians, we are people of the good news. We're about the good news. Where is the good news? Signs, wonders, horrors. Um, have you ever noticed how much people are fascinated by the end of the world? In the world stuff. Last year, last year, um, it was um, Brother Harold Camping. Remember Brother Harold Camping? I, I have a confession to make. When I was a kid, I loved this dude, Brother Harold Camping. Brother Harold Camping, he knew he was all that. You know, I love listening to Harold Camping because he, he just struck me as so knowledgeable. And even though his theology was reformed and mine was Lutheran, I, I gave him a pass on that because he was just so knowledgeable. And then I learned he wasn't even an ordained minister. He was an engineer. He was an, was an engineer. He was an engineer. I was like, oh my goodness. That's what I want to be when I grow up. I, I, want, to, I want to be someone who's got that kind of knowledge. I want to be someone who's just, just pull this stuff out of the air. So. When, when Harold started to move in the direction it did, it just about broke my heart. The day after the world didn't end, and he was interviewed, I cried. Broken old man. I mean, talk about disappointment. Well, people are fascinated by the end of the world. Um, there was an Anglican preacher by the name of Miller in the 1840s who wasn't a particularly significant figure, except that he started a movement, a movement that said that Jesus' return was imminent, and he had well over a million followers in the 1860s. Over a million followers. And the followers and friends, this was a big movement, he was a hard camping of the time, and when it didn't happen according to plan, 
this thing was referred to as the Great Disappointment. Now, the other day, I go and make a hospital call. The person comes up to me, who's not, you know, the person who works there. And I ask him, how are you? And he says, I'm fine, Father, I'm fine, but I'm a little worried. He tells me he's worried. He says, I just, it, we just have to get past December 21st. We just have to get past it, and I'm really worried. Well, and then I say, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, my encounter. My encounter. And say, run the dates. They run the dates. It doesn't occur to people that maybe since they did this thing 4,000 years ago, they get that's far enough to plan in the future. I don't plan my appointment more than four hours in the future. 4,000 years should be enough, right? But, but no, we want to turn this into an end of the world kind of thing. I mean, people, people were there just as they were last year, October 12th, I guess it was. was it, uh, we're fascinated by this stuff. You know, you want, you want a hit movie? You want a hit movie? Just put the word apocalypse into it. Just get the word apocalypse. You know, even if it's a lousy movie, it'll still probably do real well on the first weekend. We're just fascinated by this stuff. We just love this stuff. And, and that's part of the problem. I want to suggest to you that um, this passage we read is probably not about the end of the world at all. No, it just probably isn't. And I want to give you a little bit of historical background. First of all, the Gospel of Luke was written probably between 85 and 100 AD. And Luke probably uses as much of the source material the Gospel of Mark. Now why is that significant? It's significant because if you go back to verse 20, which I suggest you do right now, if you go back to verse 20, we begin to see some unraveling of what this is actually about. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are where? In Judea, flee the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. And we have a charge line here. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. And he goes on and gets nastier from there. But I want to suggest to you that the author of Luke is at this point writing about events which already happened. You see, it's real easy to create a prophecy when you're writing about something retrograde, retroactively. You see, what Luke is referring to, I'm pretty well convinced, is something we generally refer to as the First Jewish-Roman War. It began in 66 AD, it ended in 73 AD, it reached its emotional culmination in 70 AD with the destruction of the Temple. When you see the warriors gathering around where? Gathering around Jerusalem! Get out of there! Good basic advice. And when you're writing in 85 AD, or thereabouts, and you are still stinging from this, but the fact that it happened also suits your religio-political agenda, it's very easy to create retroactive prophecy. Now, by now, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this guy is one of these liberal, historical, critical kind of guys who probably has no faith and is going to tell us the Bible is written by men anyway. <laughs> well, yes and no. You, you see, brothers and sisters, I, I believe that no political agenda, no religious agenda can squelch cannot truly be distorted by the machinations of human beings. They can't be distorted by the machinations of your preacher. They can't be distorted by the machinations of theologians or seminary presidents. The words of God come through clear to us. The Spirit still reaches us after 2,000 years, for such is the nature of God's grace. So here is the author of Luke, possibly the authors of Luke, creating this retroactive prophecy. And it's pretty obvious because this is what happened. 
happened. This is what happened. Jerusalem by 85 is, is basically a bunch of bricks. And the people who lived through it, it was effectively the end of their world. The closest thing I can imagine trying to put an emotional context onto it. If you're about, well, you know, kind of a widespread of ages in this room, but all of us 